listening to episode 59 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name is John, and I am joined by our amazing co-host, Ryan. Hey, everybody. Here at the Game Deflators podcast, we like to talk about games we've recently picked up, games we're currently playing, and get ready for the Empire's best sharpshooters on today's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So I was kind of disappointed this week, dude. That Inflation Deflation Challenge that we just finished, and for people that listen, um... We typically play the game right before the podcast, so it's fresh on our minds. We just like literally put down the controller two minutes ago, got the podcast booted up, and we're ready to talk. And uh, I-, I was disappointed. You know, it really, it really hit me like a wave of nothing. Like I really don't have a lot of strong feeling on this one way or another. But we'll get into that later. John, what'd you get this week? You got a ton of stuff. Yeah, actually, oddly enough, I did, and some of it I've had my eyes on for several weeks. Uh, as you know, a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, I don't remember, I picked up that big SNES lot of like 24 games, yeah. got some high end titles in that, which was kind of not high end, but you know, your 30 and $40 some better, games. Yeah, yeah. Some little, some moderately high titles. And this week, uh, that was added again. So, uh, picked up, this one was cool. It was an N64 with controller and hookups and snowboard kids too, which anybody out there would know snowboards kids too is like an atlas game it's 40 bucks and it's snowboarding it's a fun game and uh i got all of it for 40 bucks it's like sure the best part about that story though is i asked the guy when i was finishing i said hey do you have any other games well i don't have any other games but i do have the expansion pack if you ever want to like hit me up down the road you know you can go ahead and buy the expansion pack off me it's like what the hell like he didn't include the expansion pack but he has it so i said well how much do you want Oh, uh, well, normally they sell for 30, but I'll give it to you for 20. I'm like, you just sold me an N64 for 40 bucks with Snowboards Kids 2. And all of a sudden it's like, let's quote retail pricing on an expansion pack. I was like, what part of this made sense? An expansion pack? The little red expansion pack that goes inside. Oh, the for extra like, RAM. Yeah, so you can use it for Pod Racer, I think Majora's Mask. And, Mine came uh, with Donkey Kong. Yeah, you. it's actually required for Donkey Kong 64. But yeah, dude, like the guy's quote in retail prices on expansion Why wouldn't pack. you have that in there? Like who kept their old one once they got the new one? I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm sure it was somewhere in a drawer, but I never would have pulled the expansion RAM out and put the old one in. I've picked up collections in the past <laughs> where I've literally had four expansion packs in a collection. Yeah. And they all work. Yeah. So I, I don't know, man. Like I didn't have an N64 growing up. I played PlayStation 1 when I was growing up. You know, I think that's the only console I've ever had where, no, that's not true, because I got the network adapter for the PS2, and you had to, like, install that. Yeah. Uh, So outside of that, I picked up 10 SNES games, including the Donkey Kong Trilogy. It's kind of nice. My brother, actually, like, a week before, I was like, what do you want for Christmas? And he said Donkey Kong Country 2 and 3, so that came at a perfect time. How does he not have it? Uh, Because the original childhood copies of ours were my copies that Mm. I had. So, of course, I took them down the road, and he didn't have them. Uh, Let's see. And then in that collection, I also got Kirby Adventure uh, for the NES and a couple other titles and an FC Twin. And then recently, Starlink, uh, the game that has, like, the little ship. And if you get on the Switch, you have a Star Fox component. Uh, That one was... I've played that game. It's... I've got it. It's It's not bad, apparently. Yeah, it's it's okay for what it is. I never got, like, really into it. It's well, kind of an interesting kind of, I don't know. It's okay. Here's the thing. Best Buy had it for $7.99. Mm-hmm. I cannot turn something down. It's nearly 90% off. Yeah. And has reviews uh, in excess of like 7.5 and up. Yeah. Like it's not a bad game. No, it's definitely so not. So why not? The ships are fun. Yeah. And I so like it's the, two players. So I like the collectability too. of the vehicles themselves is fun. I don't think I would ever buy more. I bought like a bunch when it was on sale back at Target like months ago. Well, anybody out there listening, it's on sale again, seven ninety nine, whole package. Normally, I'd think something on the Switch would kind of stay in the fifteen twenty dollar range mm-hmm. at that point. They must have made a lot of these because seven ninety nine for it to be that low at Best Buy, it's yeah. worth the pickup just for that alone. And I got Gravity Rush two as well. Uh, I've always wanted to play it. I need to get number one. It's on sale in the PlayStation Store for like seven fifty but I want a physical copy. So that's where I'm at, and those are like 80 bucks a pop right now. Mm-hmm. Dude, and you saw my list. It's like Guitar Man, Blood Will Tell. 
Um, Get Guitaru Man. Graffiti Kingdom. I want to play that one. And the uh, Gravity Rush. Like, they're all around the same price point other than Blood Will Tell and Graffiti Kingdom, which are 45 and 200 respectively. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, did you pick up anything? I did. I picked up Death Stranding this week is for your... my wife for Christmas. Does she listen to our podcast? She will not know. She will definitely not listen to this before Christmas. So, it, But if she does randomly, then uh, it's a freebie. You get to know this one gift. <laughs> so you're going to play that with her or is she yeah. going to play it on her own? Yeah, I'll, uh, we'll play it together. Um, I mean, I don't think I'll really miss out on a whole lot if she winds up playing it herself. But I just... I had thought about the whole Gamefly thing, and I don't know how long it would take to get that in Gamefly, and I don't know how long... Like, now that I have it, and I sent Demon X Machina back, and I'm waiting to get my next thing, like, I want to use that as, like, a better way to just rotate playing games that, like, I want to play that I haven't been able to, but... If I get Death Stranding through that, I'm going to have that for game for freaking ever. Yeah, I mean, and the way I've always seen it with Gamefly is you have to kind of beat a new title, what, once a month, once every two months to truly make it worth it? I'd say like once every three because it's only like 15 bucks a month. Yeah, that's not too bad, So I as guess. long as you're going through like four games a year, you're definitely saving money. That's not too bad, I guess. Uh well, I think the question that we are all wanting to no, know, No, I have not finished Zone of the Enders. Yes, I will have it done by next week. Thank you. You're welcome. And everybody check out, go to our YouTube page and check out John's Sekido content he's been putting out there because it's pretty cool. Some of the videos are pretty good. And he even went through and made uh, his own grinding loop to help people out there get some extra what currency points ability extra skill points extra so skill points. i was in fountainhead palace and i found a way with the demon bell funny enough because it's so much harder with the demon bell to play that game and it's around five thousand to six thousand skill points per run around and it's like 90 seconds mm -hmm. which is huge in that game i've seen some that are like you know hey you can get three thousand in 30 seconds or whatever but it's still like a matter, not even that, it's like 3,000 every minute, I think is what it came out to for some people. And then another guy was doing it and he was like, yeah, it's 6,000, you know, in like a two minute span. I'm like, can I get that in a shorter time span? So I kind of plotted out the area, manipulated it, like saw a couple other videos on grinding, but the route that I took was a little different from what other people were doing. And it's actually worked out better. And it's just consistent, like 90 seconds, you go in and out, 5,000 to 6,000, I can't remember the exact number, skill points, go rest, repeat the process, and I mean, I was getting skill points like crazy the other day, still not enough to beat the final boss. Yeah. I think Are you uh, maxed out? No, God, no. There's. I don't even know what the max is on this, but I am going... Is it something that you feel like, will grinding help you beat this boss, or you just gotta get good? I think I just gotta get good on this one. It, this boss is hard, man. Like, it's um, Ashina, or... or sword saint ashina that's who it is he's a final boss and the sad thing is you got to play against uh, spoilers i guess is a uh, genichido first who's the guy that like i told you is swiping yeah. really fast and at one level you go against him he's not too hard he's pretty like once you kind of figure out the cheesing component like okay he's gonna have a death blow he's gonna launch his way over i take a step back i wind strike him twice and then i run away block a couple arrows and repeat the process like mm -hmm. i've gotten to the point where i can get past him and maybe use one health, you know, one health element, one gourd. Uh, and in other times, I've gotten to where I don't have to use it. But the problem is when you go against, uh, a sh um, God, Sword Saint Ashina, his name is just all mixed up. When you go against him, though, he's like lightning fast. He's hitting you with all these crazy strikes. Like, I think it's the uh, Ashina's Cross, I think is what it's called. And uh, it's just nutso man like crazy crazy speed by this guy i've got him to his second form twice and i can't get past that and that's where this game comes in on the get good component i've seen some videos where like you can cheese him and it just doesn't seem as satisfying like i i'd rather be up you want to do the, the battle thing. yeah i want to do the battle right but at the same time i kind of want to get it over because i don't want to battle the guy 
a you million know, times. Yeah, I just don't want to sit there beating it or trying to beat him like 100, 200 times. I'm probably already on like my 30th, 40th attempt, I would think. And it's, uh, I don't know if it's a fact of me not being good at this game or it's just flipping hard. And I don't want to remove the demon bell because then if I remove that, that means I caved in on the difficulty component of this game. Hey, I'll never forget my uh, God of War fight with uh, Ares at the end. I just couldn't beat it on normal. There's just no way I could beat it. And I had to bump the difficulty down and I was felt so bad about it. Yeah, I mean, but I just couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, right now I'm in a situation where the difficulty is at its highest. So I could theoretically lower the difficulty because I have been playing on hard mode in a sense or harder mode. But I don't want to. I want yeah. to get past that, that boss with that demon bell. So well, and that's what those games are all about, is getting that satisfaction. Exactly. You're doing so something tough. It's better than Neo, I can tell you that. Yeah. Neo is like a similar kind of style yeah. in terms of that Dark Souls-esque uh-huh. type of style. But it has that um, samurai type of vibe going for yeah. it versus ninja. And I I just don't like it as much as I do Sekido, man. Mm-hmm. And Sekido seems to be a little easier. And even with it being so difficult... I'm not sitting there like thinking there's no way I can beat this boss. Neo, yeah, there was what times where I'm like, there's no way I can beat this. Sekido, I know that if I continue to do what I'm doing, I will beat the boss. You'll get there. Yeah. So that's what I've got, man. And um, it's very disappointing so far. However, we're going to talk about our biggest mm, disappointments in more 2019. More disappointment. <laughs> so... Worst Gaming News of 2019 is something Ryan and I are going to chat about here in a bit. We're going to start off with an article by Kotaku. It was uh, by Steven Totio, and it is the biggest video game disappointments of 2019. So let's start off with, I would say, what do we have here? Our top three? Well, top that's four? that's ours. Okay. We could talk about real quick just what he had in his article. So in his article, he covers uh, Anthem being a total train wreck all year and uh, the team behind Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga and those um, yeah, went under shut their Alpha doors Dream. in August, it says. Yeah. Um, Stadia just kind of having a, a rocky start. Uh, Activision and all of their cuts that they made so early that this one, year for folks that'll click the article that had the most interesting line i felt in that they had a quote from the activision ceo uh bobby Kotick, and he just said you know we went ahead and had like record sales the company's doing great and not too long after that they cut eight percent of their workforce well that's why you're having record sales every year is because you're cutting your workforce yep. every time you uh you do okay we've got um Blizzard and the whole thing with uh, Hong Kong and, you know, how they dropped the ball there with uh, Blitzchung. Uh, Epic Game Store and all the stuff that's come out this year with Epic Game Store. You know, we've talked about it before. People not happy about having to get away from Steam in order to get some of these exclusives and some of these exclusives just kind of being, you know, shady a little bit people were very upset with Shenmue they were promised to get it on Steam and it didn't happen and then uh re- more recently Pokemon Sword and Shield came out there was the Dexit and uh for those that don't know exactly um Ryan's comment there so the Pokemon team or really Game Freak decided to not include every single Pokemon in the Pokedex so what ended up happening was fans that of years have been playing it since you know Red and Blue we're coming in this game like, all oh, right, I can finally see like all of these Pokemon that I have been playing with for all these years, you know, in this new vision of Nintendo Switch. And they're like, no, we're not doing that. You know, it's, we just can't. Well, and then they also turned around and reused some models and assets, which people were upset about. And I'm not I'm not really big on either of those topics. I don't I think it was kind of blown out of proportion and people are being a little bit, you know, well, I mean, it does say in this article here on Kotaku um, that really a lot of fans, they had a Game Freak Lied trending on Twitter. Yeah. So you had a huge bulk of fans that were like for Game Freak Lied and were, and a lot of folks came over to their side. But then there were just other core fans who were like, just shut the hell up. Like, we, yeah. we don't want to hear. Th- some like, people really came Pokemon. out to help support Game Freak and have their back on some of these. Yeah. Um, we've got 
the website Deadspin went down. It was a video game website. You get other news. And then ending off their article, they talk about how much Game of Thrones sucked. <laughs> I think we all know how much Game of Thrones sucked. And uh, honestly, it was the biggest disappointment for me in, in 2019. Not Like everything. Yeah. All, all items combined of nerdtopia. I would say that was the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So... We'll have that article linked. Uh, feel free to jump into that and read in depth on uh, what Kotaku goes through. Ryan and I are going to discuss our top three worst gaming news items of 2019. So uh, I guess we'll start with you on what is your third worst. We'll go down. So the least worst until you hit the worst. I think that Fallout 76 is probably the least worst just because... It has been, much like Anthem, an absolute train wreck. We can't get away from news about how bad things are. And uh, just recently, I don't know if you saw, they had another situation happen where they did a free game weekend. And people were able to go in and just hack in whole assets from Fallout 4. Like the giant floating, um, I guess it's like a blimp airship. Like they just hacked that into the game. They hacked in a bunch of NPCs before Fallout even had a chance to release their own NPC package, which is really just them admitting, hey, we were going to make a Fallout game, but instead of putting it all out at once, we're going to le- release it in bits and chunks, and they still haven't come out with, oh, the story and the NPCs. So that's coming soon. I just think that Fallout 76 was a horrible experiment, and I think it went absolutely wrong, and they took every chance they could to make it worse instead of better and they got greedy with their whole um, fallout first supporters pack for a hundred dollars a year subscription i'm just over fallout i want fallout 76 to go away i don't even want to hear about it anymore what about fallout 5 no no if there's a fallout 5 announcement you're gonna be like nope i don't think so i mean we've got outer worlds now like people are really stoked on outer worlds still i know that it wasn't you know the peak of performance but bethesda has never put the follow out fallouts out as like a peak performance type game they've never been you know they've always been glitchy they've always been kind of second tier graphics and i think that you know they did a really good job with outer worlds in doing those same things but not doing them as bad and just breathing fresh life into uh you know a play style that people enjoy but giving it a new background and uh outer worlds isn't bethesda so i think it's the original team though right that did like fallout yeah it's people from obsidian yeah so my number three on here, so uh, least worse so far, would be Blizzard having political involvement in Hong Kong. Nothing good came from that. I mean, going ahead and like, you know, having players removed and just the whole involvement in general and in all the other negativity around Blizzard throughout the year, that was just not good at all. And I mean, you really just separated gamers too at that point. You had some gamers that were like, okay, well, you know, and I'm kind of on that boat of, you know, You shouldn't get involved whatsoever, but I could see the reasons why you did it from the financial perspective, Mm -hmm. but you should have stayed out of it. Yeah. And that's ultimately what it was. Maybe they felt that they had to be involved in some capacity, but you could have done it on a little bit of a lower scale. So it didn't create such animosity amongst gamers and really kind of fragment, you know, everybody that was involved within a lot of those online games with Blizzard. I think it was uh, Hearthstone. Is that correct? Yeah, Hearthstone. But there was a lot of community outreach in other games too i know that um there was a push for one of the characters i think her name's mai who they were trying to push as like a resistance you know here's a resistance skin you know this should be like she's going to be our front for like the hong kong resistance in online gaming you know so there was it brought in a lot more than just what hearthstone was in the community and stuff yeah and in marketing i mean we always hear like there's no such thing as like bad press i guess but at the same time this was like really bad pr for them like yeah it's 
they were exposed and uh, or had a lot of exposure. It came from it. A lot of people kind of who may not have known a Hearthstone and all that kind of came through to woodwork to to I guess learn about what was going on and probably not in the best you know best yeah, situation. It showed, it showed gaming to non gamers in not a great light. Exactly. And then there was also. Um... They had their BlizzCon this year where they announced a bunch of big stuff, trying to hope that, you know, these new announcements would just sweep everything under the rug. Yeah, and they had protesters and, you and everything else outside. Yeah, I don't hear about it as much now just because there is some time between then and now, but I don't think that they were as successful as they would have hoped. I don't think that people forgot the way they hoped people would forget by just showing off some shiny new diablo 4 stuff yeah exactly so you know they i hope they learn their lesson what's your number two uh number two this one uh has been going on all year so this is the first year they stopped supporting playstation 3 and playstation vita on the playstation plus with game releases and i really feel like the quality of my ps4 titles that i'm getting every month doesn't push the limit to where i feel like that has been made up for like i feel like i'm just getting less for my money and not that i'm getting like maybe a higher quality ps4 title every month like i think that you mean you don't like monster supercross i just think the service is i mean it's definitely not worth as much to me anymore i don't do much online gaming at all so that aspect of PS Plus really is kind of wasted on I me. Mean, I'm really only there for the free games. And I really just, I loved getting free games on my Vita and my PS3. Like, it was an excuse to keep playing those consoles. And without those reasons around, I just don't feel like I'm getting what I want out of it. And I know they couldn't do it forever. It's just unfortunate because I I feel like there's, there's room to make up for that somewhere well, there's a reason it made your worst gaming news of 2019 list and i'm in the same boat dude like the playstation 4 while there have been some good games that have come out i have quite a few playstation 4 games that i've gotten over the last few years and it's the quality of those games on the playstation store that have come through for ps plus users have not been there mm -hmm. you know i mean neo come on neo had been out for what nearly a year and a half two years at that point you could pick it up anywhere I think it's been longer than that yeah probably longer than that you could pick it up for 15 10 bucks in most places and here they are throwing it out just before it gets released as a game of the year edition yeah i mean it's like a full like that's one of the that's a great example because i feel like neo is like one of those titles where it's like this is a great big game that had a lot of hype like that's the kind of thing that I think PS Plus would be good for pushing out. But like you said, it's been so long. It's already a reasonably priced game. Most people who are into that game probably already had their heyday with it and have left it behind. So, yeah, you're getting it out to people like me that have never played it, that thought it looked good. But for $10, I'm, I'm better off doing that than waiting and hoping that they're going to give me something. Like, I would use my money better just buying two-year-old games oh and uh for anybody listening that has that whole mindset of well you guys are getting free games like why are you complaining i have spent a lot of money on sony over the years from the playstation 1 on up to the playstation 4 and the playstation 5 in the future so when i as a user of that many years i would hope that some of my games coming through on a service at 60 bucks a year are going to have some good ties like if that's your promise you're gonna give me free games then deliver on the quality of those games. Like, I don't I don't care, you know, if it's five or six, like, indie games that are selling for, like, five bucks a pop in the store. Like, at least I got that quantity of games and that variety. But when you're, like, trying to entice me of, well, here's Neo and Supercross or something, you know, it's just not enticing. Mm -hmm. And I think the last two months, well, last month, I know for sure I didn't download the, the games. They just weren't games that you I want play. to download because I already had, well, no, I already had them. Oh, okay. Like they were just titles I already owned. And I understand a lot of people are going to run into that if they buy a lot of games like I do. But if you just go through, say, free digital titles, stuff that I can't pick up physically, I think that's a better option. You know, why am I going to why am I going to spend the time downloading and filling up my hard drive space with something I can pick up locally, you know, brand new? Like, if anything, promote that game. Let me pick that up, you know, 
in that situation, like at a local place, and then throw me some indie games, like throw some of those smaller developers a bone and like let them, you know, kind of showcase their material. So that's really where I stand on it. Um, my number two, I would say Microsoft acquiring Team Ninja. And a lot of folks might ask why I care so much about this. I absolutely love Senwa's Sacrifice. And to find out that it's an Xbox exclusive after that acquisition, it just, it's heartbreaking because I really want to play that game. But I don't like Microsoft gaming systems. I've never found value in them. The quality of exclusives has never been there. I don't want to buy an Xbox to play this game. So now I'm in that whole hope that they release it on the PC, which if they are smart this year, they will not. They will just keep everything Xbox exclusive and have their, you know, standard PC titles coming out. So that that kind of sucks. Like, that was a really good game. Truly enjoyed playing it. Awesome experience. And also it's like, hey, number two is going to be on Xbox only. So worst gaming news, Ryan, right there. Worst gaming news. Um, I think that... You didn't put a third one, sir. No, I know, but I've got it. I think that the... <sighs> I learned a lot this year, you know, doing the podcast and getting more, you know, up to date on like gaming news and paying more attention to stuff like that. I've learned a lot this year. And one of the things that I learned that absolutely changed my opinion on a lot of stuff is just a lot of the dirty stuff done with publishers and a lot of the, you know, the tax evasions that they use by headquartering out of other countries where they can dodge taxes and paying nothing here and just treating their workers bad. We've heard a lot about crunch this year. I think that my worst gaming news is just that I feel like game companies are becoming worse and not better. And they're taking a huge advantage over us, the customers and their employees as well. And I just think that, that's ultimately the worst thing in for me this year is just learning how bad things really can be for something that's supposed to be like a fun, positive thing. Like gaming should be a good, happy, prosperous thing, but it's got this big looming shadow over it. And the more I learn about that shadow, the more informed I am, which is good, but just the more disappointed I am in the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that statement, dude. My biggest, most disappointing bit of gaming news in 2019 would have to be the announcements of gaming or GameStop closures that are supposed to be coming up and just the, the lack of stores that weren't producing as much. Reason being behind that is, yeah, we have mom and pop stores that are out there that are in the market and you know, got great retro titles and everything else. But GameStop has always been there for, what, like 15, 20 years? Mm -hmm. Between EB Games and Babbage's and GameStop, like GameStop's the one that, you know, came Held through on. all of that. <laughs> well, I mean, there's EB Games out in, I think, Canada and such. And, oh, really? Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen EB in forever. <clears throat> yeah, they're out in Canada, I believe, and in other parts of the world. It's kind of like Toys R Us. Toys R Us is in Canada. Hmm. And I think they were bringing it back to the U.S. after a whole Oh, thing. really? But yeah, but that's besides the point. Um so GameStop in general, though, I've always gone there for, you know, brand new titles sometimes, like for pre-orders, uh, the access to use titles, because it's just always been a, a pretty big variety. Their website has always had a lot of titles on there. Like, I can't go to a mom and pop store, or mom and pop short, ah, store, Jesus, man, and find like an obscure PS4 title for a cheaper price. Like GameStop generally has like the market value versus or not market value, sometimes below versus if I go to a mom and pop store, they're like, oh, well, it's, you know, $75 on eBay. Mm -hmm. GameStop's here at 44 if I find it there. Mom and pop stores is 75 because, well, it's selling for that on eBay. So they're like true resale shops. GameStop has that ability to, because they're such a large company, yeah, we don't care about, you know, such such a game went up to 100 bucks. It's still $60 in our system. Mm -hmm. you know, like, it's gone up a little bit, but we have so many in stock nationally that we can keep it at that price point yeah. and that's the understanding they're never going to sell you something for more than what it's worth yeah in their opinion on what the market is like they kind of set their own market which i like in that respect also the ease of access you know for me to go in and have a wall of you know two three hundred used playstation 4 games or ps3 that's a games, good selection at your fingertips exactly versus mom and pop shop yeah i go in there but you're 
hiking up prices based on eBay. You know, your your selection isn't as good. And there's so many of them around that it's you so can, spread You're better thin. off going online than yeah. going there. Yeah, exactly. Like, why would I go to a mom and pop shop that's not going to allow me to do a full-blown return on an item when I can go to eBay and buy it for the same price mm-hmm. plus have the eBay buyer protection? Yeah. And, like, have the ability to negotiate my price in a sense i can mm-hmm. get it you know at a lower cost on buy it now or bidding for it whatever it may be mm-hmm. versus hey here it is 75 bucks that's what you're gonna pay i'm sorry like i'm not dipping the price down at any point and oh by the way if you don't enjoy the game and you want to return it or the game doesn't work well we're only going to do in-store credit for our particular location and that's just always how it's been with those stores and i there's just an easier access these games GameStop's a lot more flexible and i don't think people realize that a world without GameStop in it for gaming is gonna suck yeah as much crap as we give them where are you gonna get a wide selection of used games for new titles you're not going to best buy you're not going to walmart yeah or target like you go to GameStop for Mm -hmm. that so you know and there's a lot there's a lot that's really changing with that like uh we've got another article here uh redbox is gonna stop renting out games and just the launch of stadia and the popularity of the xbox gamer pass uh playstation now you know there's a variety of services that are really trying to change the way that we interact with games and getting rid of those brick and mortar touchstone used game stores like gamestop that's really going to be a big push in the favor of those companies that want that control back yeah, exactly. And, you know, Redbox, it's interesting you bring that one up because of the closures. It kind of reminds me of, like, Blockbuster, right? When, mm-hmm. you know, people are just like, well, you know, why would I go in, pay five bucks a week and get a movie when I can, you know. Just got a, Disney Plus. Yeah, or Netflix <laughs> or whatever it is. Like, Netflix, I'm paying $10 a month and I can get four or five movies, like, at the time. And there really was a need for Blockbuster. Redbox kind of swooped into the whole, like, dollar a day thing, mm-hmm. which I think worked for a while but now we're getting to a point where you have disney plus and um you know netflix and amazon prime and all these other or if you have cable you have on demand there's a lot of movies yeah. you can watch before they're out on dvd yeah exactly on cable. So, and hbo like you have all these options now to watch movies like why pay the one dollar a day to rent a movie when you can pay ten dollars a month and have access to all those movies like i haven't gone to redbox i used to go to redbox a lot but i haven't gone there for a while now because half the time the movies that are on redbox that i end up paying a dollar or dollar fifty to watch are now coming out on netflix like a month later Mm -hmm. or on amazon prime a month later like why would i get it from redbox and pay that extra money for something that and it continually happens yeah like oh we want to watch this movie two months later it's on there like why why did i spend a buck 50 like two months ago yeah. consistently and from a gaming perspective i can see why they're doing it why are you going to pay two dollars a day to rent a game mm-hmm. that you can like within a month you've spent sixty dollars for that game and to your point game flies 15 bucks a month why would i go to redbox for two dollars unless i want to test it well and that's the thing is we need to we need to see if we can get in on this redbox thing before it's over because we still need to get jedi fall in order for next week hopefully hopefully if we don't we have a backup idea yeah backup idea so i think it'll be pretty pretty fun if we go it'll be good either way yeah so So that was uh that was by josiah motley at no techie and then we've kind of been reminiscing about the year all the bad news all the things closing john what's what's give me something it's just your takeaway for this year like what's something that maybe it wasn't news maybe it's just like a feeling what you got yeah so for me dude 2019 has all all been about publishers and studios not finishing their stuff uh I'm so sick of unfinished games. We saw it with Anthem. We've seen it with Fallout 76. We even saw it with Red Dead with their online component. You know, things are coming through unfinished, untested. You know, they haven't gone through every step of the process. Just like, let's throw out this title because the market needs to have it on this day. And I'm over here just like, I don't want to download a day one patch that's four flipping hours before I get my game. I want to jump into my game and play it. 
And on top of that, if you're going to have me download a four hour patch, it better not be glitchy and not working yep. when I start playing it. Like that's complete BS. I, I had that issue with Agony when I wanted to play Agony. I still haven't picked it up and it's still somehow $30 brand new. The game is like absolutely trashed on reviews and it's patchwork was terrible. It was supposed to be an adults only game. And they're like, well, we're, we're going to cave to the market. So we're going to put it as a mature rating. So like they got rid of all of the, like the horror and hell aspects of that game just because they wanted to try and sell more copies as a mature, you know, and game. they didn't even and then, make that mark. And they didn't even deliver. Yep. So that right there is like my takeaway in 2019. Like game publishers who need to start finishing their crap and delivering on their product. I've seriously started going to more indie studios specifically because they finish their games and like they know we need to get this done right because if we get trashed on reviews, we're closed. Well, and we've seen a lot of places that are being praised for delaying games because it yeah. seems like it's safer these days to delay a game and release something because everybody's so tired of this. Exactly. I would rather you as a game studio, if one of you is listening somehow, which you're probably not, delay the game versus releasing an unfinished product. Mm -hmm. It's just going to make your consumers happier. We're not going to be pissed off. We're going to give it stellar reviews, and you're going to succeed because the consumers are going to be happy with in what you put run, in the market. In the long run, we'll be much happier. Yeah, look at Anthem as a prime example. You released a crap product, unfinished, market didn't like it, and now it's in the bargain bin for most stores. Right. Yeah. What was your takeaway? I think that loot boxes are slowing down. I think that there's been a lot of backlash this year. There's been a lot of people passing laws or bringing up in uh, lawmaking spaces of gambling and preying on children and people who have addictive type personalities and fall victim to these tricks that game studios are using. And I know that they're not gone. I know that they're not going away anytime soon, but I feel like there has been a shift in the mentality and only those people who are really cashing in on loot boxes I think they'll continue to do so, but I think moving forward, a lot more studios are going to be hesitant to adapt that model and use it going forward. So I'm hoping that in 2020, we can see a dip in loot boxes and we don't have that kind of plaguing us for as long. Yeah, loot boxes were a huge bit of a talk, at least the last couple of years, and especially this year. Mm -hmm. And to your point, man... Yeah, I, I think it's gone down a bit. I think they got enough backlash from both a global perspective and cultural perspective, as well as just, you know, for once our government stepping in and like, you know, kind of talking about this and bringing it to light too. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, loot boxes just piss me off. Like, I've never again, bought a loot box. I haven't either. But again, put out a good finished product and your stuff will sell and you won't have to worry about yeah. putting out loot boxes. And you can just put out DLC content and mm -hmm. skins and everything else like in an appropriate manner versus what well, NBA 2K20, I think. Yeah, which, like, it, the whole commercial was basically looked like they were at a casino. Yeah, for sure. Like it's the dumbest concept. Uh, I understand why they do it, but, you know, it's not yeah. making people happy and it's ruining They're lives. They're being greedy. Yeah, pretty much. Um, let's see. So next week, before we get into our inflation deflation challenge, we're going to cover up our, um, cover our 2020 trends to end. So last year, 2019, we talked about some different trends that needed to end. I think loot boxes was actually on that yeah. list. So we should probably look back at that episode and write down what we had because we didn't have an appropriate timeline. We'll at that see, point. we'll see how far we came in ending those trends and what kind of trends we should look to end in 2020. Yeah. And on top of that, catch us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It is at game deflators on Twitter at the game deflators on the other two, uh, YouTube like, like, and subscribe. And then also find us on all of your Apple podcast apps and Android apps. Leave us a review five stars. We five. want them stars. Only five stars. And, uh, if you don't see us on a podcast app out there, let us know, and we will try and get on there. All right. Inflation deflation challenge. So this week, continuing with Star Wars Month, we have a game I've never played before. Actually, I've never played either of the games in this series. Uh, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. 
So this one is uh, Vicarious Visions. They also did the Insane Trilogy for recently. They're recently. a good studio. Yeah, they're not a bad studio. So uh, Lucas Arts is the publisher, of course, and then Chris Foster is the designer of this game. I'm sure there's more than just Chris Foster. And it was released in March of 2002. Uh, it came out to pretty good scores. It's actually got about a seven and a half, eight. Uh, the GameCube version, which is what we play, is actually the worst reviewed version of the game. And the Xbox had rave reviews. Everybody said this was a killer Xbox game. Well, uh, I guess let's go into pricing on this one really quick for the nitty gritty on our uh, how we felt. So, most expensive version is a GameCube version, actually, mm -hmm. 1999, and the cheapest version is the Xbox version. So, it's super odd that, well, no, it's not. I think this suffers from the Nintendo effect mm -hmm. of it being just a Nintendo game, Yeah, and it's staying at that price for some strange reason. Uh, complete in box, 1999. It peaked back in April of 2016 at 2999, and uh, it's trending upwards, actually. And then uh, the loose price, thirteen fifty three. Currently, it actually peaked at thirty eight fifty back in two thousand seven. I want to say that's when it. Um, no, that's not when it came out. What was going on in two thousand seven for it to be so high? I don't know. That's weird. Somebody and, uh, probably just overpaid. Yeah, probably. And it's holding right now at that uh, price point, but the thirteen fifty three. But I kind of saw it trending a little downwards, too, in terms it's, of... It's one of those ones where it kind of just wobbles. Yeah. It, it wobbles, but it's not It's not going to hit 15, and it's not going to hit 10 anytime soon. So the one of the reviews Ryan read and what was an issue with this game on GameCube was the controls. I'll tell you, the sensitivity was absolutely horrible. I had to up the sensitivity up to, like, max when we were playing. I just could not handle GameCube the not visuals. known for being a good dual-stick shooter set up no not at all and it really did did suffer in this particular uh situation it was hard too i think we had two health pickups in the entire like time that we played and we couldn't find another one it was a hard ass game man like i said these are the empire's best if these guys were in the rest of the star wars all the jedi would be dead i've never been hit by so many lasers playing a star wars game stormtroopers are supposed to be missing you and i'm pretty sure they hit the mark in every single occasion yeah it was actually pretty rough like i, I don't know how they hit us we we had a tough time getting through the first level of this one so we uh you know, we always switch off, not like every death or whatever, but we switch off and there was just time where we would get to a point. We have no idea where to go. We have no idea what we're doing. We don't really know. And the AI partner is very unhelpful. So pushing our way through, figuring out how to open doors and use elevators, we got through all that. That was fine. But then we reach a point where there's just so many enemies and... Like John said, we had no health pickups, and it was just like, okay, well, I guess we can throw ourselves against a wall of lasers until we get through this part. Yeah, it was pretty rough, and what's so stupid about it is you go through the first like little section of a level, and you have your AI... There's no tutorial. Yeah, there's no tutorial. You have your AI helper coming through with you, right? You go through a situation of maybe battling 12 stormtroopers initially to like get to where you're at, and she's like, oh, I need you to open up this door. So you crawl through all these crawl spaces, blow up a machine, go up and get shot like four times by other troopers and a, a guard. And then finally open a door for her. She's like, all right, thank you for opening it. I'll hold here and try and figure things out while, while you, you go do the rest. <laughs> and there's like 30 stormtroopers there. Yeah, I'm like, are you kidding me? They're all over the place. Yeah, so like we just had like this mini tutorial with a partner who helps us get through 12. And then, oh, yeah, here's 30 stormtroopers. And sorry you're at like 40 HP now and can't get past anything. No. So stupid, man. You know, one thing I can definitely say about this, this is a great Star Wars game in the Star Wars aspect. Like, it looks Star Wars. It sounds Star Wars. It's it's very cool being in a shootout in a hall with those like white bar lights on the walls that yeah. are, you recognize from the movie. And it's like, yeah, I'm in like an Empire facility. Just not at that difficulty. Like, yeah. And it just wasn't. I mean, I loved it. I, I thought it was fun, like what we did and the shooting and everything else was great. And the overall the story component that was tied to it when we first started playing was great. It's just as difficulty in this particular game is rough. So that that's where I stand, dude. Like, great-looking game, 
Uh, I really do think that it probably does deserve that 7.5 and above praise. I think there's just a lot of jank between then and now. Like, making this game back in 2002, no doubt this was impressive and good and strong title then. But we've just come so far that sometimes games are hard to go back to because you're used to so many quality of life improvements. Well, not even that, though, man. Like, I play dual stick shooters and stuff all the time. And it's not an issue. This was an issue. Yeah. And it just didn't seem like I was getting enough weapon pickups. Like whenever I killed stormtroopers, I picked up ammo, like laser ammo somehow. So I don't know how you recharge a laser weapon. Like Battery it should pack. be should be unlimited. <laughs> but at the same time, like every time I picked up stormtrooper weapons, it went up like by two. Mm -hmm. Like really? He shot me like maybe four times or shot at me four times. And you're only going to give me two lasers. He only had six bullets? Yeah. You're telling me he only had six bullets? Yeah, he only had that many. So I could have just wiggled around and then he would have been done. He doesn't right. have unlimited ammo. Yeah, that's seriously like that was just dumb. Um, my take on this overall at 19.99, no way in hell do you pick this up complete in box at 19.99 when you have complete in box versions that are cheaper on the Xbox and it was just Xbox, right? No PlayStation? Uh, No. No PlayStation. I think it was just Xbox and yeah. GameCube. And it's also on PlayStation 4 digitally, I think, and, and a Switch. Nintendo Switch digitally. So do yourself a favor. Don't pick up the GameCube version of this. Go pick up the Xbox version. It's cheaper, and it gets better reviews anyways. That's the controls what, on GameCube suck, yeah. and the graphics aren't as good anyways. Yeah, I, I would say pick this up on Xbox for sure if you're going to play it. Yeah, so GameCube inflated. Or PC. The PC version's probably fine, too. Probably better, actually. So I would say inflated on GameCube, probably deflated on Xbox based on that price point. I'd say 10 bucks if you're buying it on Xbox. Okay. I, I, I go right? with that. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. So how it lays on our website will probably be inflated. But if you actually heard the episode, you're going to know that we said yeah, the Xbox. Yeah, inflated because of the version that we play. Yeah. So folks out there that aren't listening are getting punished for not listening to us and our advice. <laughs> All right. So what do we got next week? Potentially fall in order. Hopefully fall in order. If not, backup plan. For some people still out Star there, Wars. Still Star Wars. That is correct. And hopefully next week we've both seen the movie as well. Yeah, and we could talk about that. Yeah, I'll probably see it on Saturday before we actually mm -hmm. uh, record on Sunday. Okay. Yeah, so that should be good. All right. All right, dude. Uh, so anybody out there, again, find us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Like and subscribe everywhere on your podcast applications of Apple and Android and let us know where we're not at. Plus, Ryan, what do we want them to do? Have a Merry Christmas or whatever other holiday you celebrate. I was going to go with five star reviews, but that's also good. My name is John. I'm Ryan. And we are the, the Game, Game Deflators. Deflators.